Good evening, everybody, and welcome again for those of whose first lecture it is. Welcome to the 68th Summer School. For those of you who have been before, it's been a long day, I'm sure, for some of you. So I'm going to be brief <coughs> in my introduction of John. Sorry, I can't see without glasses. Sorry about that. Okay, John Matteson began political reporting at the Rand Daily Mail in 1974. He received a prison sentence for refusing to divulge his source of reports about the Muldergate scandal. You may remember that, and I didn't know that about you. Um, he, 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 um, he, he did this work while barred from the apartheid parliament throughout the apartheid era as he was considered a security risk. He was a foreign correspondent in Washington for the Rand Daily Mail and in Johannesburg for National Public Radio. He has been published in, in the New York Times, Financial Times, Washington Post, The Observer, and many others, including all the major um, newspapers in South Africa. After four years as a broadcast regulator in the Mandela administration, and two as editorial director of the short-lived This Day newspaper, he became the United Nations chairperson of the Electoral Media Commission in Afghanistan. He returned for a from a second to in Afghanistan to write his first book in French Hook. His book, God, Spies and Lies, was published in 2015. He has, was appointed to the interim board of the SABC in 2017. So please welcome John Matteson. Thanks very much. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. Happy to take questions. Yeah, thanks. Uh, is that that's audible? Good, thanks. Um, uh, when I was on, uh, thanks very much. Uh, um, welcome. I, uh, thanks for coming out and this, this late in the evening. Um, when I was asked to do uh, a talk uh, here, it, we were in the middle of a uh, um, particularly tricky uh, moment at the SABC, but they, they all seem to be tricky. What you didn't, and as I've been re reappointed for five years, so the uh, interim board has been expanded into the permanent board. Uh, uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, that's, of course, a mixed blessing. Uh, um, but uh, um, that, that's an oddity of the, the, uh, of the uh, 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 legislation, but that's how it works, so we are there. Um, so we were five, now we're 12, 12 although um, we're down to 10 and they'll be advertising for a few more. Um, but uh, I have to say it's been, uh, um, uh, the good news has been that there have been, uh, uh, I have found myself working with people one could work with from very different um, uh, backgrounds and so on. Um, b b before I start, uh, um, I'm assuming I, I couldn't write this book now. Now that I'm on the board, I couldn't be this frank in print. So I'm, I'm assuming there are no journalists here who are going to uh, get me into trouble because as a board, we. Uh, so I'm assuming it's off the record and no one will quote me. Uh, that seems to be fine because uh, as a board, we don't particularly look for uh, publicity. But I did want to. Um, uh, to, to do this talk anyway, and that's, that seems to be fine that I can. Um, uh, I, I, when I wrote this book and I gave talks, people said, are you, are you less pessimistic than when you wrote the book? And I had to think how pessimistic was the book, because obviously I was determined to say how I really saw things, uh, what I thought had really happened had got us to the point where we were under Jacob Zuma. And when I wrote the book, uh, I was very critical of both Zuma and uh, Mbeki, and I really wasn't sure what sort of reaction I would get. Uh, but the night of our launch in uh, uh, Cape Town, we went for dinner with a group of journalists, and that was the night of 9-12, Nenegate. Uh, and of course that changed everything, so I might like to think I pushed the wave um, of, of the fight against corruption a little bit, but I could sure surf it after that. And so I was pleasantly surprised that the, uh, uh, the mood in the country has really changed very much. We tend to forget that two years ago there were still many people who got very cross if you criticised Jacob Zuma or, or, or said that things were, were seriously corrupt. So uh, my, my 
my talk tonight is, is, is actually fairly optimistic, um, but I, I, I'm not going to let, leave you the op optimism without first imposing a little bit of the pain that I experienced in the SABC on you and give you a little pessimism first, but it's because to give you a sense of how we got to where we are and, and what, what it's really been like. Um, Um, uh, now, one of the reasons I, uh, uh, why, why perhaps you're here is because the SABC is the first institution the government is, and parliament has set out to change. And uh, uh, what I found striking when, when I was doing my writing is that, in fact, broadcasting was the first thing to change in 1994 as well. Uh, uh, it actually changed before Mandela took office and I took office as a broadcast regulator about 10 days before... President Mandela did in 94. And that's exactly what's happened now. And as you can probably tell, the plan is that um, if we get SABC right, the process has started with ESCOM. You know, there's a, exactly the same process of an ad hoc parliamentary committee investigating corruption in ESCOM, which will lead to decisions. Uh, in our case, it was to fire the old board, bring in a new board, and, and clean up and, and be held accountable. And I have to say the positive thing has been Parliament. Uh, Parliament has been very tough on corruption and supportive of us in both pressuring us to keep fighting corruption and supporting us when we do. So that's been the good news. On the other side, which is, now you'll see why I don't particularly want to be quoted, th there's the thing called the EA. When you're in government, they talk about the EA. The EA is the executive authority. Um, and you can gather who they are. And they are on the other side. So you actually sit in Parliament, in parliamentary committee hearings, where parliamentarians are on the, in the ANC and the other parties are supporting you. And the minister is, is, is putting spanners in the wheels um, uh, quite, repeat, quite insistently. Um, so to give you an idea, we, we, I'd been out of government since 1998 because I'd been a whistleblower against corruption uh, in that time. And suddenly I was appointed to this. It's still not 100% clear to me who did it, but I, it seems pretty likely that there were some people in the ANC who, who, who read my book and actually thought, uh, uh, thought about me when they were, when they were picking this, um, this new board. And... Um, so the board was chosen by Parliament. Parliament sends the name to the President. At this point, the way they'd handled it, the President had no flexibility about who he chose. So he had to confirm the appointment of the five names given to him by the, by the Parliament. And um, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the Parliament uh, had... Um, uh, it, uh, under the legislation, he had a certain period to appoint us. So there was no board. The company was in severe stress, and he didn't appoint. So I called an ANC friend of mine and said, when's he going to do it? He, said, he looked at the, the legislation, he said, the last day is Sunday night, he'll do it Sunday night. I said, do you know, have you any inside knowledge? He said, no, none at all, I just know Zuma. He'll do it, wait to the very last minute, regardless of the impact on the corporation. That's what happened. I was watching TV at quarter to seven on the Sunday night, and we got appointed. But that didn't mean we were allowed into the building the SABC. The SABC uh, leadership didn't accept our appointment, and nor did the minister. And so Parliament uh, had some meetings in the SABC, and they invited us. So we, as the new board of the SABC, could only get through the door brought by MPs. Uh, there was a first meeting, then there was a second meeting, and at the second meeting, uh, we were brought into an auditorium like this one in the SABC to be introduced to the staff as the new board of the SABC. As, and, and the uh, chairman of the uh, parliamentary committee on uh, communications started introducing to us, and we'd each stand up and get applauded, and as they got to my name, I got a tap on my shoulder, someone handed me a letter from the minister saying, dear Mr. Madison, you hereby uh, required not to take up your appointment as a member of the SABC board. <laughs> that was still under faith, Mutambi. We've had three ministers in nine months. 
which of course, as you know, is devastating to, to good governance uh, because they each start with no background in the area and so on. So I was, you know, I was still an, felt an outsider and I thought, well, I'm not going to lend my name to the charade. And I said to uh, my one colleague, I'm going to... I'm going to say what the letter says. And he shrugged and said, OK. So I stood up and I said, well, thank you very much for the applause. I'm, a, I'm afraid I have to tell you, I've just got a letter saying none of us on this board at all. And <laughs> then two very weird things happened. The first one was I must have spoken very fast. And a lot of people who don't, weren't naturally used to my accent, um, uh, most people didn't understand what I'd said, so it was sort of wasted. The second was one ANC MP came up to me, and he was livid with rage with me, and he said, we're leaders, we'll solve this, we'll resolve this privately, don't say it in public. And I must say, we've still since made friends, the uh, MP and I, and, and we've sort of found each other, because um, he, 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 they did, in fact... Uh, work hard to resolve it uh, in a genuine way. And the new minister that was then appointed, that, by the way, was the Thursday that Pravin was fired. We were formally appointed by the m minister the same day that uh, the... Uh, the um, no, no, yeah, the, the same day that Pravin was fired and the, the um, uh, cabinet reshuffle happened, we got a new minister, but we were also approved to start... And, um, and then we, uh, uh, by the way, in the, in the, when we get, got up to the boardroom that first, for that first meeting, uh, there were 11 guards outside the door. So the securitization in the SABC, as other places, is quite excessive and extraordinary, and you would think might be uh, a, little, a, a little money might have been saved on that, given that there was this little financial problem. But of course, the financial problem wasn't admitted. In our first meetings with the executives, I specifically said, does the SABC, is it in financial stress? They said, absolutely not. I said, is there any, are there any bills that are due that are unpaid? Absolutely not. My second meeting, the same thing, said by someone who is a registered CA accountant in the South African Institute. Of course, it turns out that things were so bad, and this is, in a way, on my way over here, people were talk, being interviewed on the radio about ESCOM, and I think you'll find some of the similar things in all the institutions. The, um, I was put on the Audit and Risk Committee, and I was on the board, and I kept asking for financials. They weren't naturally provided. Here's a company that's just lost... a would turn out to have lost a billion rand, a company that has no reason not to be profitable. The SABC really is able to set its own profit because it decides how much public service broadcasting to do and how much to do that is profitable. So it should be able to manage always to be in profit. And when it's been well managed, it's always been in profit. Um, uh, and so I asked for the financials. They weren't provided. We didn't come to meetings and get them. So I said to the, the, the acting CEO, um, so you had a risk committee, and I, by the way, I'm new, I'd never been on a risk committee before. Uh, he said, yes. I, he, I said, did it function? He said, yes, perfectly. So it warned you of the risks? He said, yes, sure, of course it did. So I said, it warned you that the risk was this company was going insolvent, the, 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 the curve had gone like this, and then it was going straight down, you're going to be in massive debt and you wouldn't be able to pay your bills. He said, no, no, it warned us that the risk was that Treasury wouldn't come in with money. <laughs> so I said, and I'm really just using common sense here, I said, that's like saying the risk of me not paying my rent next month is that a, an uncle I've never heard of will die and leave me his estate. And he, he pushed back very hard. He said, no, you don't understand, John. Treasury must fund us. We are a public entity. Uh, ministers demand services and public, uh, have a, give us a public mandate. They call us up and tell us to do things. Treasury must come in with money. 
And that uh, mentality, by the way, still endures throughout the organization. Uh, so much so that, you know, uh, we get hit. I was just uh, telling a friend, uh, uh, Chris here, that uh, we get hit from all sides all the time. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, last month in December, uh, the unions went on strike and they said they weren't going to cover the conference, the ANC conference, the, the, uh, the um, screens would go dark. Uh, and we said, but you know, how can we give you an increase? There's no money. And they said, no, you must go to Treasury. SAA got money from Treasury. We must get money from Treasury as well. Um, so, so that was the, the mentality, really, very much. And so I went and talked to uh, a friend, very senior in Treasury, and I said, this is extraordinary. I've, I've never seen anything like this. Isn't it astonishing? He said, no, it's typical, and yours isn't the worst. So um, I, I know it's a backhanded way to come to optimism, um, but what I've concluded, and I'll start to give you some figures of what we've achieved in the time we've been there, is that um, these, many of these people have gone into a mode, you know, Pravin Gordon talks about connecting the dots, and the corruption is so rife, that they have, that, and when, they, when an accountant stops giving you financials, it strongly suggests that he knows very well this cannot go on and they will be caught at some point and there is a lot of uh, backhander theft going on and they assume that, they, that at some point it will stop and people have lost control of just taking money as long as they can. Um, so what, what we did achieve is, uh, this is just to give you an idea, uh, we took over in April uh, we lost something like 200 million in April, 70 million in May, 35 million in June. By October, year to date, October, uh, in the previous year, under Shladi Matsuleng and those people, we lost 400 million. In our term, we lost 3 million. In other words, we broke even. And if you consider that the first three months we didn't really have control of, you could actually say that for the first six months we, we would have made money. Um, and I have to say that this is without doing anything creative. I mean, my background is broadcasting. I was a broadcaster in America. I would re the exciting part for me is talking about new programming, getting stuff from America, Russia, Britain, and so on, you know, South African innovative programming. We didn't do any of that. It was entirely done in the negative, just by tearing up contracts and stopping substantial amounts of the theft. Not all of it, I'm sure. Um, I should say immediately that we, I haven't seen the figures, I'll see them when I go back to Johannesburg next week, um, for uh, uh, November, uh, December, January, and February are the worst months. So we will be in the negative again. And so for the year, I'm not guaranteeing we'll break even. I'm sure we'll lose a little. Uh, but we've stabilized, and for next year on the same terrain, we, 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 we'll, we'll be in, back in the black, I would think. Now, we have a debt overhang. We've asked Treasury for, for a guarantee. We've had no real clarity on their attitude. We don't re it's very hard to get clarity of them saying, no, we won't give it to you for this reason. You just don't get a clear answer or you get contradictory answers. Um, but I'm, we're, we're working on the basis that um, we want to be able to survive even if we don't get it, although obviously it would be helpful if we do. Um, so that's one of the reasons I think that our economy is extremely resilient and that uh, <laughs> I don't know if this is also true of ESCOM because the ESCOM numbers are so large, 250 billion in guarantees and so on. I, I don't know. I don't have an answer to whether they can fix as relatively easily as we think we can. Um, but I do think that there is resilience. And the other thing that's given me optimism was we've been interviewing for new staff. You may have seen a report in the papers which I don't want to say too much about today because it's become very controversial. It was announced uh, one of our top executive appointments, which, according to today's uh, news, the president, the minister, is disputing our right to have made this appointment. So it's another headache, and we've got all the legal uh, clarity on our side, but I'm, not, I'm still not sure how it'll end. But what we did find, I sat in on a lot of interviews in Johannesburg with young black professionals 
And I was extremely impressed with a new generation of black South Africans who have the requisite professional training and every bit as important, quiz us to make sure that we're going to retain our integrity before they choose to join. So I think there, there is real reason for optimism. Of course we know there's a shortage of the right skills we need. There are all the other problems. But, but I have been very uh, heartened, and, and I feel more, more positive than ever that if, you know, the big problem is the political will, but if there's the political will, this can be, can be fixed. So since those figures, what we've been working on is, is how to uh, uh, grow the re revenue. And I maintain in the, uh, in the boardroom that there is, there is money lying on the floor in the SABC waiting to be picked up. And I'll give you uh, just the most simple example. Do you know that the SABC's Zulu radio station is one of the biggest in the world? Seven million listeners of Kozi FM. Uh, Umflobo Weneni, the Koza station, is about four million. Um, there is a crying demand for merchandise, for T-shirts and things like that. We had never, ever signed a, a deal to merchandise our brands. I mean, the, the, you know, this is not the sort of thing I've spent my life being involved in, but it's really just uh, requires no, no, no particular thought. We've signed our first three contracts for 50 million, and there's no risk. Our contract is with, uh, with uh, merchandising companies. Uh, all we give them is our brand. We, we put down no money, we get 50, uh, something like 50, 50 back on, on their profits. So that's just the first 50 million that we weren't collecting before. Um, there have been other major things like that. We, our internet service, we have, we have um, quite a big internet footprint but the most awful, technologically awful platforms. We need, we've had a contract to upgrade our websites. It was turned out to have been corrupt. Money was paid in advance, and the work was never done. So we've spent months trying to work out, can we get anything out of the money we paid? And we basically scrapped it. We're starting from scratch again. Um, there's also a syndrome which is common in, in uh, government institutions that they always want the Rolls Royce of technology. And of course, it's quite common that boards, and I'd include myself in this, don't necessarily know enough to say, no, we don't need the Rolls Royce of that. All we need is the minimum. So we're now going to be starting some things like uh, some things that really are the minimum and cancelling those contracts too. Um, so so, so that's, the, uh, that's the story of the. SABC, I'm not just wondering how much I should say about it. We're, we're in a current, uh, this um, problem we have now, what happened was last uh, month, in the last two months, uh, the courts took a decision on, in fact it was the same day as the, as the cabinet reshuffle and therefore went, was not noticed by the press. Uh, the Save Our SABC and Media Monitoring Africa, which are these NGOs that fight for press freedom and, and, a, and an independent SABC, had taken the government to court and won a really important case which said that our board is independent and its decisions have to be taken independently. And this is key because legislation has been developed as well as a, a mode, um, uh, various agreements between government and the SABC over the last ten years, since, since actually the Becky era, that have steadily encroached on the SABC's independence, which was supposed to be pristine in 1994. And one of the particular things which relates to the news of today was that executives could, had to be approved by the minister. So our top three executives, CEO, COO, and CFO, must be approved by the minister. Well, of course, that's how we got Cloudy. What's her name? And that's, of course, a very serious problem because independence stands or falls right there. Well, a judge by the name of Motajani in Gauteng wrote the superb judgment, which, was, uh, uh, which he read on the day of the Pravin uh, reshuffle,
Robin Gordon reshuffle, which said that SABC's independence is vital to our democracy. So he really just put it in terrific terms. This is fundamental to the Constitution. Uh, the constitutional requirement for democracy requires an independent public broadcaster. That means the, the board must be independent. That means the board must not have to run its appointments by the minister. So a week later or so, we have a new minister again, a third minister in then was six months or so, seven months. And we are called to Parliament to account in, in the Communications Committee, and the minister sits on sitting in the front and having us sit behind her. And she announces that uh, she's, she's appealing the judgment. Uh, now, I, I have to say, we did know a few days earlier from her that she was going to do this, but she had, uh, we didn't, didn't expect her to announce it then. Now, the legal position is once you appeal the judgment, um, it's frozen, so we were no longer independent until it settled. Uh, but the, the applicants, the Save Our SABC and Media Monitoring, immediately went to court for a, um, a, a declaratory order, um, it's got another name, but this will do for the moment, uh, which says that while this decision is being undertaken, uh, while the appeal is underway, we should have our independence. We then intervened as the SABC board, and we reached an agreement with the minister on a draft court order, which we agreed and signed, and then the uh, court, the, the judge made it an order of court, to say, we retain independence on the following terms, that we, can, um, um, we, we must consult with the minister, but consultation is in the strict terms of the uh, particular judgment by Ch former Chief Justice Chaskelson, which means we must tell the minister, we must discuss with the minister, we must take account of her views, and then we're free to do what we like. And, and uh, she has no veto. So that's what was signed in December. And if you, you'll see in tomorrow's papers, I'm sure, um, and, it's, and it's on the net tonight, that the minister is, uh, there, there was a leak of our first big appointment under these terms, very important appointment of the chief operating officer, it was announced in the Sunday World yesterday, it was picked up in the, on the net and in the papers today, uh, and the minister has put out a statement, and President Zuma has put out a statement saying uh, uh, they know nothing about it, uh, any such appointment must go to the cabinet and be approved by the minister and cabinet. So. We're saying, obviously, in this, obviously I don't want on the record, but we're saying, uh, haven't you read the draft order? The draft order is, uh, the, the, sorry, the court order. The court order is, is absolutely clear. So these things go on. Uh, uh, <laughs> there's, an, there's never a simple outcome. Um, so I think that's, that's enough on the SABC for the moment. I do think that you'll find with many of the... So he's the same uh, sort of situation prevails. The fact that it's so bad in a way is good because it means if you put honest people, it's, which is obviously a big if, but if uh, Sir Ramaphosa has the will to do it and, and the authority, uh, the cleanup uh, uh, can be fairly quick. And I know that there are people around Ramaphosa who are saying they, they think they can get junk status reversed in 18 months. And... Uh, um, from my experience, that seems to me plausible. Um, so now I thought just for the rest of the talk, I would, I would go on to, to speak a little bit about where we are now in the light of the last week. And so obviously this is a bit speculative. Um, and I wanted to sort of ask the question, who is Cyril Ramaphosa? I've known him a long time. And um, uh, what and how will he make his changes? And the first thing I want to say about Cyril is he, he's seen himself as defined by what happened to him in 1991 in Durban at the ANC's first conference legally back at home. I was there where he was elected um, Secretary General beating Alfred Nzo, the, the candidate of the exiles. And I've always thought that the relation between the, the the uh, split between internals and exiles was extremely important. And he won. He had so much support, he was seen as the next president, as a, as a, a coming president. Um, but in his own view, 
He was very, very bloodied by the experience because Tabo and Beck, he never forgave him, never let him forget it. And others, you know, constantly undermined him afterwards and said that, uh, and, and sort of made him feel that he was not quite legit ANC because legit ANC meant, meant the exiles and the old, the old groups. Um, I, you know, he's obviously been um, damaged by Marikana and can discuss that if necessary, but I still think, uh, and so, so that's paper, obviously taken some of the shine off him because from what I know uh, from the, um, the people involved in the Marikana commission hearing, he wasn't guilty of causing anything, but he, his, his crime was one of omission and it was a serious one uh, according to them. But, you know, as someone who'd been president of the Mine Workers' Union and someone who was on the board of, of Lonman and, and a massive shareholder, one would have assumed that he would have driven through and seen the conditions of mine workers and kept in touch with these deteriorating situations. And the evidence apparently was mainly about his absence, uh, which, you know, one would have not expected uh, from someone uh, in his situation. Nevertheless, especially someone who was hoping to be president. Nevertheless, I, for me, the fact that he was a lawyer, a constitutionalist, the father of the constitution, proud of the constitution, and an internal person, put him in a different culture from uh, um, um, the, the exiles who'd been, uh, I think Barney Trabordi had a good article yesterday in the Sunday Times talking about the hard, hard experiences of the exiles, but it made them very hardened and very intolerant. Uh, and maybe there are other reasons for their hardness and intolerance, but that's um, uh, ir irrelevant to this discussion. And uh, the UDF internally had a culture of a much greater de democratic uh, um, manner of functioning and for all these years there have been many who felt that it was a mistake or at least and Barney put it rather well I thought that it the you know UDF closed down uh, you know UDF was the sort of internal ANC it represented over 600 different organizations it was national it worked in a very democratic fashion the unions were a big part of it and they had a very democratic tradition at that stage which I think they've some to some extent lost um, and it closed down for the obvious reason that people felt the apartheid government had always tried to divide uh, the ANC uh, or you know its opposition and so they'd always said our leaders are in prison and in exile we're not the leaders we're just here as surrogates and they closed down but the, Barney made the point well I thought yesterday in saying that the, it's rather unfortunate that even if they were going to close down, they didn't have a meeting first as equals and say to the exiles in the prison parts of the ANC, these are the things we've learned about how to function above ground in South Africa and, uh, you know, and, op and in South Africa in whatever form, and you should take them seriously. And, and of course, the very extreme version of that, and this is why Zimbabwe, I think, is fundamentally different. Uh, Zanla and Zanu, in uh, Zimbabwe really have, have been interlinked in a very tight way all these years. And so ZANU never had the traditions of de democratic traditions that we've had in South Africa. And that's why what you've seen in these uh, last, uh, last months in Zimbabwe is a sec effectively almost an amalgamation of the army and the, uh, and, and the party. Um, and that's disturbing, but I'll come back to Zimbabwe a little bit in a moment. Um, the other difference was that I always thought, you know, I trained uh, Mandela and Mbeki and the others for TV and radio in 91 and uh, spent some time with them. And, you know, Mbeki was trained in um, Leninist organization at the Lenin Institute in Moscow and in economics at Sussex. And I think that explains quite a lot about how he operated. But one of the things about it that strikes me, and you may uh, want to quiz me about this, but is that he, they always, that uh, culture, that political culture was always big bore. They always dealt with macro political issues. And when he came back, he looked at the economy in a macro way. He looked at the total position and he took a more conservative position. Cyril is much more micro, which I think is much more important. If you're going to fix South Africa, you're going to have to fix it sector by sector. And so I was encouraged when he said on uh, Saturday, 
Uh, first of all, words matter to him. He reads a lot, reads a lot of books, uh, and, and he thinks and he's open to growing. And, um, you know, his experience, uh, I covered the uh, mine workers strike that he led uh, in the late 80s. And, of course, he w it was sort of a political victory in the sense that he, um, um, uh, it built his, his stature considerably. But they actually lost in the short term, but much more in the long term. As wages went up, the number of mine workers plummeted. And so when he had that strike, it was the biggest union in the country. Now the mine workers' union has shrunk and shrunk as there's been less and less investment and more and more mechanization. And of course, he better than most people understands the specific reason for the decline in mining, which is that uh, uh, policy uncertainty. While the mine owners have a lot of reservations about a lot of policy. The most important is that you have to negotiate a d deal, and whatever deal it is, even if it's a fairly tough one, you have to be able to say, I understand that you're now going to put billions of rands into a hole in the ground and get nothing out for five or 10 or 15 years. Therefore, we've got to give you policy certainty. And I think he, th that's an example of where he was being very specific. And, uh, um, and, and I, I believe he meant it. Of course, time will tell if I'm right. Um, so what, what he did, uh, if, if you followed what he did, he's adopted them and, you know, his, his, his first moves in uh, KwaZulu-Natal, uh, going and paying homage to the king, to the Latuli, the other Zulu leaders of the ANC, and then requiring Jacob Zuma to come to the birthday bash in hostile territory for him, for Sir, in Cyril's territory and not Zuma's, which was um, uh, East London. And, and then, unlike Zuma, Mandela liked stopping the booing when Zuma was booed. Zuma allowed people to be booed when he was in charge. Cyril, like Mandela, said, we will not be factional. So I think the line, what strikes me, I don't know if you saw the interview he did last night, um, enormous confidence. He's able to ha he feels confident that he can, he's able to handle anything. And of course the three toughest things that came out of the ANC conference, which had a lot of people uh, in a tiz, were uh, number one, he said that uh, you know, the, the conference concluded that there must be confiscation of land. Of course that's disturbed lots of people. The second was uh, that uh, um, uh, everybody must get free, 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 um, free education. And the third was that the, the Reserve Bank must be nationalized. Now, these are all big things that potentially could be very destabilizing to the economy. And he's handled them uh, with great confidence. And I think, and I can't prove this, but I think time will prove me right about this, he's already worked out what he's going to do. On the Reserve Bank nationalization, actually means nothing uh, the way it, it will be done. Because I've met uh, someone who is a Reserve Bank shareholder. Uh, it has no power. It doesn't affect anything. The Reserve Bank's governed by legislation. Um, so he can say that the, the ownership is now changing. But I don't see the mandate of the Reserve Bank or its independence changing at all under uh, 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 Cyril. So I think, and obviously I'm projecting here, but from everything I know about him and the people around him, they understand that, you know, Reserve Bank nationalization sounds sexy, but it means nothing, so we can do it quite enthusiastically. Um, secondly, uh, uh, land redistribution, unlike many people in the ANC leadership, he knows that the Constitution allows for that already. The Constitution has, says nothing about... Um, uh, 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 willing buyer, willing seller. It's not in the Constitution. It says nothing about uh, uh, confiscation market rates. What it actually says, and people forget this uh, uh, a lot, is, uh, especially a lot of activists, what it actually says is that any law can be passed as long as it has general application. In other words, you can't pass a law that says... Um, I'm giving Jacob Zuma so much, a, a particular piece of land. Um, you can, uh, you can um, 
uh, confiscate ter- uh, land, but it's got to be based on the historic use, the current ownership, prior ownership, how it was acquired, what it's needed for, and the payment for it is uh, is determined on the same on those cri- those sort of criteria. The reality is that, uh, as most land uh, experts that I've spoken to say, is that very little has been done along those lines. Um, Cyril knows, because he's in the weeds with the micro stuff, and has lived here all his life, unlike um, his his two predecessors, he knows that, in fact, the government has an enormous amount of land that's unused. So he can start there, and he's already said he's going to do that. And he's also put in enough caveats to drive a truck through, saying that uh, nothing will be done that hurts uh, uh, food security and uh, is financially unsustainable. And he, he also announced immediately that he's going to do, they're doing an audit of land that's already been uh, uh, transferred to find out how much of it is unused, is it not being utilized. So, uh, and on the fees, he's, he's found, a, I haven't looked into this, uh, the, the nut, nuts and bolts of this, but he say, he's said that uh, fees will be expanded progressively over time as they can afford it, and they'll start with free fees for people earning under three, families earning under 350,000 a year. And um, so that, so I, so I think, you know, I found him remarkably confident, and I think there is some grounds for it, that he can maneuver that. You know, so much, ma- I, I know quite a lot of, um, Uh, Analysts argue that personalities don't matter. And I think we're in a time when that's hardly a a, a tenable position. When Mandela took views on uh, Zimbabwe, for instance, very critical of Mugabe, the whole parliament of the ANC supported him. Uh, Thabo Mbeki came and reversed that policy and most of the parliament supported him. So I think, and AIDS, of course, uh, Mbeki got tremendous success for a long time. So I think... If Cyril takes these positions and implements them, uh, he'll have a lot of support because, because uh, you, you want to work with the president for a whole set of reasons. Um, so how is he going to um, uh, deal with, with, um, uh, uh, with Jacob Zuma, the, the elephant in the room? Um, I think that um, what I've seen him doing in the last few days already, and you, you, you've obviously been able to watch the same things, um, he's first of all done the Mandela thing. He's, he's, he's said, we want unity and I won't be factional. Secondly, and we want Zuma to have his dignity, but secondly, he's saying we're going to do everything strictly by the book. I heard on my way in here, because I drive in from Franchuk, that uh, uh, the, the, there's been an announcement that the Guptas, uh, uh, um, uh, one and a half billion of their property is going to be... Uh, 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 going to be um, not confiscated, but it was going to be um, forfe- forfeited tomorrow. So uh, I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work, but, it's, but you were already seeing things happening. I think he'll, he'll, he'll keep tightening. Once he's established that the Latuli House is the center of power, they're making the decisions, and Zuma has to operate by them. If he violates any of them, then the uh, NEC will be under strong pressure to remove him. If he cooperates with them, uh, he gets himself into more and more trouble. And I don't, I've no idea how long it'll take, but everything points to the fact that that's the process and however long it takes, it'll take. Uh, um, and, and, and it doesn't look like, uh, like he's got too much going for him left. Um, so the last thing I want to say before I stop is that, um, um, I'll wait for time, yeah, yeah. Um, on the economy, there's, there's there, there, mining we've discussed, uh, manufacturing he's, he's, he's got some options on. South Africa must, the, the question I ask, and I don't have time to explain this properly, but too well, is, is why did South Africa's economy, even in the good years under Rebecca, not grow as fast as any of our other BRICS uh, uh, member countries. And I have three main ones, responses. One, South Africa missed the information boom. And I talk about that more in, in the chapter of the book, that uh, it, it had to do basically with political interference by Mbeki. That could have been turned around, and the studies show that would have been worth 1.5% in growth.
The second was the resource boom. We entirely missed the resource boom. boom. Uh, our company started, uh, started uh, building mines in Chile and Russia and all over the world, but here. And the third point I will always raise is how the, the Zimbabwe's economy cut in half, and it was our biggest uh, um, African trading partner. Now, on all of those things, I think Cyril understands them, and, and on Zimbabwe, you know, the new, the new regime is not exactly attractive, but they are much more economically realistic. And I think that um, uh, Cyril's foreign policy is going to be, as, as an internal, is going to be much more focused on South Africa's direct national interest than was Mbeki's or even Zuma's, who had this notion of the UN and the AU being the most important thing, work through the multilaterals, grow our status in, um, uh, in, the, in the multilaterals, in the UN, the AU, and so on. I once had this conversation with uh, Trevor Manuel when he was Minister of Finance, and he was talking about changing the IMF and the, and the World Bank, and I lived in Washington. And I said, Trevor, that's never going to happen. Do you honestly think the United States is going to give up control of the IMF, the World Bank, the UN, even through the Security Council? And he, it was surprisingly easy to get him to admit, yeah, no, it's not going to happen. I think Cyril understands that much better, and he'll focus on what really matters. What matters is Zimbabwe. We now have growth coming in Kenya and, and Ta Tanzania and some other places, Mozambique. These are the economies that matter, and as we focus on them, I think it was no accident that he had the president of Kenya here. Um, so what does this mean for... So I, so I can see, if, you, if he turns around economic growth and creates jobs, I can see his political star of him and the ANC uh, 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 rising uh, between now and the next elections. Now, of course, it's a long time between now and the next elections. Things could fall apart. The ANC could split still. But uh, uh, my preliminary view right now, and maybe it's jaundiced by the fact that the DA is in trouble right now, uh, particularly bad trouble here in Cape Town right now, is that um, Cyril is likely to, to bring the party together steadily and forcefully. Uh, uh, he'll find ways to give the people he needs to something to keep them busy. Um, and by 2019, uh, uh, he, will be, uh, he will be in a good position. If, if Jacob Zuma goes down, it won't be, you won't see Cyril in front of the television putting him down. Uh, but you, I think the DA is going to be in a, in a more difficult position. It's not at all hard to see Cyril, who was, for, after all, in the UDF with uh, Musia Lakota, bringing Cope back into the ANC, uh, strengthening his ties with the Kusatu in the Communist Party, which he's always had an affinity for, if not ideologically, but personally. Uh, um, and actually uh, doing rather well in the, in the election in 2019. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yes. I beg your pardon? In firing Zuma. You know, I, I, one really is guessing. I, I think he's close. I think the, the, the fact that Sean Abrams' people are suddenly starting to remember that there were Guptas on, in their files um, uh, is, is interesting. Uh, as I was just thinking on the way here, could this be, in fact, not the year of Olatutambo or the year of Mandela, but the year of prison? Um, uh, I, I think it's fairly close. Yes, I mean, look at, look at him. I know this is criminology, but did you look at his face uh, the last few days to being brought to the Eastern Cape and humiliated in public and have Cyril have to and show what a gentleman he was in defending him? He's very weak, and, and, and Cyril has admitted that he's had, two, I think, at least two meetings one-on-one -on -one with him where he's been talking through with him, and he's holding his feet to the fire because he's doing it through the system. He's applying the due process of the ANC. I would say it's fairly close. 
You know, this is the million dollar question we'd all want to know. I, 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 I suspect it's pretty close, but I really don't know. It could take longer, and I think part of it is what else is going on. I think Cyril wants it to happen, the project to come from somewhere else. You know, either the, 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 the judicial system, what they can do and what they will do is they've instructed him not to appeal these court actions he's appealing. So if he continues to do it, he's violating ANC policy, he can be taken out. If he doesn't do it, then the court action uh, uh, um, uh, is, is implemented. So I don't see that he can, can, can follow. I think that's, that's the nub of the, of the problem for Zuma now. And I think it's fairly close. I think, yes, yes, exactly, I, I, I do think it's going to be, the law is going to be a part of it, whether it's that case or one of the others, but probably that case, that, that will be the impetus that can be used to get him out. If he's charged, they can say, well, how can the country wait? And, and I do think, although he has, still has his enemies in the ANC, the people, uh, 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 you know, there were only two ministers at, in Kandla this New Year's bash, whereas apparently last year there were many, many more. People, people uh, shift power. He's a lame duck. Whether he's out now or in a year's time, he's, he's, he cannot offer uh, political protection to people anymore. But I do think the legal is definitely part of the stranglehold. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I was afraid you were going to ask this. Let me tell you what the, the situation is. Well, first of all, Cloudy and Aguma were out. Right, we, 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 we dismissed Cloudy and Aguma, the CEO, resigned uh, in the middle of the uh, dismissal process. Um, we have now gone to court to block their pensions and to recover money from them. So Cloudy's 11 million bonus and these other issues, and that money keeps growing, by the way, because as you find more things, they can be added in. Um, okay. Okay, now, now this, this, is, this, is the, this is the disappointing part. When we want to go, we've done some of our own investigations, but when you want to take action, uh, criminal action, or even civil action, in the SAEs, you're required to go through the SIU, the Special Investigative Unit. The Special Investigative Unit, I'm not going to say it's captured, um, you can make your own judgments, um, but they charge us millions of rands for doing the investigation. Uh, they've got quite a broad uh, range of issues, and we're waiting to see. That's how it's done. Pretty much, and it's. But you know, I've said I, I spoke to David Lewis, you know, the Corruption Watch, and I said, David, how do I get a prosecution? Can you tell me what to do? He said, No, I can't. And I think uh, I spoke to several other people whose names you'd recognise. Um, if the NPA and the SIU and you know the, the basic institutions don't do their job, and the police don't do their job, it's 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 hard. There is also the other thing. I mean, look, you know, the big question always is how fast should we move? My instinct is to move much faster than we have. Um, my colleagues tend to restrain me, and they may not be entirely wrong. I, I, I think they're at least partly wrong. Um, but, uh, um, uh, yeah, it's, 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 hard to, it's hard to get people actually charged and dismissed, but... Uh, you will definitely see that this year. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, um, the question was how will Cyril man ma manage Ace Mogashulu and David um, Mabuza? Um, I think, I think there, I, I, you know, he's he's got he's he's got as president and the chair of the party on his side, um, and and the third one, the NEC, of course, is split three three. But I don't think it's equal when there's a president in the room. Uh, I think he'll. I think so. You know, he's had. He's had so much experience of this. I, I, I meant to say, unlike Donald Trump, he, he, he's, a, he's a good negotiator. <laughs> um, you know, he, 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 he's really got so much experience uh, of this as Secretary General, and, you know, in the unions, the business and in politics. Um, I, th I think uh, uh, ACE will be working, working both sides for sure. Uh, Mabuza um, is is playing. Uh, you know, the, I suppose the real question is if tr if charges come ag up against either of those people, what will Cyril do? Because both Mbeki and Zuma protected people from charges. I don't think Cyril would do it, but if it's that high level, who knows? I don't think he would do it. But I don't know for sure. Oh, yes. You think of the SABC as one SOB. Yes. And from what you said, it's really the board that plays the decisive role. How optimistic are you about changes to the boards of the other SOBs to be able right. to bring about the kind of It, 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 thanks. It all, dep it all depends on Parliament. If par well, well it's, it may be harder because Parliament had a bigger role in the SABC because they, they chose the board, board members. Um, it's it's going to depend on who chooses the board members. If Cyril is dominating in the choice, I think he can do it. I think that's the answer. And he of course, of course. Of course. No, <laughs> no, that's clear as daylight. It all depends who chooses. I mean, we—if you go through the minutes of the boards that, well, you know, you know, you know. Look, you know, I don't want to pretend to know more than I know. I mean, Cyril is playing his cards close to his chest. He's going to start changing the the the, the chest the the, the 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 pawns and bishops on the table. I just don't know how long he'll take over each one. But but if he just to finish your question, if if they choose to put the right people in, they can change them all. Uh, sorry, there were some new people. Yeah. Well, I assume it was bro it stopped because of all the politics that was going on. So I assume it will resume in the next couple of weeks. Yes. Yeah. The SABC inquiry was brilliant. It was. And it No, I, th I think he's going to stop the nuclear deal. I think he will stop it. Funny enough, I think that Nkosazana would have to. Um, uh, Zuma will try till the day he's stopped, but I, th I think that uh, I think that uh, I think that C C Cyril will. Uh, I, I think they'll stop it. It's just so obviously inappropriate. Um, sorry, there were one or two new questions. Yes. Um, 
The question is, what will happen to the EFF? I suppose that depends. You know, they're, they, they, they're very clever young people who are getting a lot of education and evolving. They, they're growing and changing their views and getting smarter and more sophisticated. But I think they're in a bit of a, uh, a difficult position right now. The ANC has has agreed to their main demand, which is land confiscation, even though they're not going to implement it, but neither would the EFF probably. Um, so I, I, I think they, they're, you know, they, they, they did badly in the elections in 2016. They grew from 6% to 8%. That was much less than was, I mean, that's good going for a new party, but it was much less than they predicted, and mu much less than they predicted or ma many others predicted. So I think they're now in the hard road. Uh, uh, and I think if, if Saul uh, uh, um, operates effectively, everybody's going to be uh, uh, under pressure. Sorry, you, it was you. I think it's off topic, but do you know the story behind all these poisoning things and why, why do they go to Russia to treat the poisoning of David Magruza? And he even threw attention to it at the conference. <laughs> Uh, no, I, 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 wish, I wish I had such uh, <laughs> secret knowledge about oh, the poisonings. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so interesting that, uh, um, you know, Mandela always knew where the best doctors in Johannesburg were, or Cape Town. Um, uh, these guys go to Russia for their uh, medical treatment. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. No, hold on. Yeah, let me take some new ones. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. <laughs> 